Good morning and welcome to Doylestown Presbyterian Church. My name is Reverend Becca Bateman and I'm delighted to be with you this morning as we are here to worship God. We welcome you here in the sanctuary and we also welcome our online viewers and those who are live streaming later on today. We are so excited that you're here and we want to offer all of the opportunities that you have to worship the Lord our God. And with that, would you worship God? Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join me in the call to worship as printed in your bulletins. This is taken from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord. Who forgives all our iniquities, who heals all our diseases, who redeems our life from the dead, who grants us the steadfast love and mercy. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord.
The scriptures say that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and therefore none of us escape this need to confess to God. And we will do so corporately as we're called to do, and also a time for personal reflection. Would you turn to your order of worship and pray with me our prayer of confession this morning? God blesses those who realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is given to them. But we have been the Spirit, and the self-sufficiency. We have forgotten how we did God blesses those who are hungry, thirsty for justice, for they will receive it in full. For we have come to and and possessions in this temporal world. God blesses those who are persuaded because they live for God, persecuted because they live for God, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. For we have too often retreated from the disapproval of others. We sought to please the world rather than risking the disapproval of those who made it himself. Lord, please show us your mercy. Lord, have mercy upon us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Friends, I proclaim to you in the name of Jesus Christ, hear the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ. The scripture lesson for this sixth Sunday after Epiphany comes from the sixth chapter of Luke's Gospel, verses 20 to 26. Let us listen to God's word. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what your an their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
would like to invite the children to come and join me for our time together this morning. Tell me what tomorrow is. It's Valentine's Day. What happens on Valentine's Day? What, what happens on Valentine's Day? What? You presents and what? And what, what do you get? What else do you do on Valentine's Day? Oh, okay. What, what else happens on, bring, on Valentine's Day? I, what, I, I don't understand the word you're saying. Rainbow, rainbow on, on Valentine's Day. Maybe like some of the rainbow candy or something. So, do they still have those little hearts that have messages on them? You have those too? And chocolate too? So why, why do we have Valentine's Day? It, it is special to people. Absolutely. It is a special thing to do. Valentine's Day is about love. And you knew that. Oh, great, great. Uh, so, so I have a question for you when it talk, talks about love. How do you know your mom and dad love you? How do you know that? Okay, they give you kisses and hugs. What else? <laughs> hugs and kisses. How else? How else do you know your mom and dad love you? They take care of you. Do they make sure you have enough to eat? Yes. And that you stay warm? And that you have clean clothes and that you get to play in the snow all those are things in lots of ways that that parents and just one time one time parents sometimes parents also show love that way too just once and not more than once so that's that's part of of how parents show their love well i've got a valentine here for each of you and i want to use it to help you know about how God loves you because all the things you've told us, told me about how parents, how you know parents love you is because they show you, right? And so this is a way that we know that God loves you because God showed it. So, oh, you need one? There you go. So on this Valentine, I've written a verse from the Bible. And it comes from a book of the Bible called John. And it's the third chapter. You have a Bible too? Great, great. And you have two Bibles. What? Wonderful. I'm detecting a trend here today. From <laughs> so when I'm going to read this for you now. And when, when you get home, with your mom and dad, let them remind you of what it says here. This says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That God showed his love for us by sending Jesus. And so maybe one way to think about it is it was the very first Valentine. And it came from God long ago. And it's a reminder that God loves us forever. So let's pray together. And if you'd repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for your love. Thank you for sending Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Thanks. I have extras if you've got anybody else you need to give one to? Brother, sister, somebody? Okay. Please join me in prayer. We give thanks, O God, for this moment when we can be still in your presence, when we can open ourselves to your word. We ask that in this moment you will send your spirit to us so that we might hear the message that you intend and be led to respond in ways that bring you glory and honor. 
For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor. With those words, Jesus begins a time of focused instruction to the 12 men who have given up everything to follow him. Just prior to that scene, Luke, the gospel writer, has named all 12 of those individuals and then provided a glimpse of a moment when Jesus received wide acclaim, both for his teaching and for his healing. There was a great crowd that was present for that moment. And it's after that in the narrative that Luke tells us that Jesus gathers just with the twelve again. Think about it. After what they had just witnessed, surely they had many questions to ask him. I'm guessing that many of them didn't know each other all that well either as they just begun this journey together. And yet Jesus doesn't come with a time for debriefing of all that they have witnessed. He doesn't pair them off with, with open-ended questions as an act of team building. He starts to teach again. Blessed are you who are poor, he said, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. He goes on to speak of a blessing upon them in the moments that they find that others hate them and exclude them and revile them and demean them because of their connection with him. He says, rejoice in that moment and, and leap for joy, for great is your reward in heaven. I'm guessing at that moment there were some puzzled looks on the faces of the disciples, but Jesus isn't finished. As he goes on to speak of woes or hardship that will be upon those who are rich now, those who are not hungry, those who are laughing now, and those who are receiving public acclaim. And when he is finished with those words, I am imagining, even though Luke doesn't tell us, that some of those disciples really began to wonder what they had signed up for. It's a challenging set of instructions. And before we dive more closely into hearing what Jesus might be saying to us through them, we need to be clear that this is not the same as that other moment that we refer to as the Beatitudes. That moment of instruction from Jesus is found in Matthew's Gospel. And in it, Jesus offers nine blessings without any warnings. Whereas here, he has four blessings and four woes that are the direct opposite. There's a different tone between those two moments of instruction, too. For here Jesus says, Blessed are you who are poor. While in Matthew's account, Jesus says, Blessed are you the poor in spirit. Here he says, Blessed are you who are hungry. And in the other sermon he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This passage isn't a spiritualized kind of blessing that Jesus is talking about, but rather to people who will face literal, physical, and spiritual hardship. The two sermons inform one another, but they are not the same. With that as a point of clarification, we turn to hear his message on that day, just to the twelve, a message that can be a source of comfort or discomfort, depending on where we are seated. For instance, when he says, blessed are you who are poor, and later says, woe upon you who are rich, those words will be very heard very differently 
by some of our guests last night in our homeless shelter versus those who were there to help him. When he said, blessed are you who are hungry and woe to those who are satisfied, that is received very differently, I think, for most of us in this room. When he speaks of a day of laughter for those who are mourning, certainly that is a word of encouragement. But then for him to go ahead and speak of how those who are laughing now will face hardship is an unsettling kind of message. Perhaps it is that, that final pairing that Jesus offers on that day when he speaks of times when individuals are hated or reviled, that pushed aside is one that is more universally heard as a source of encouragement for, I think, Many of us have had moments like that over the years. And yet, whether or not we hear this message as one of good news or hard news, what Jesus is, in fact, speaking of is this great reversal that will happen when the kingdom of God is fully experienced on earth. He's talking about how, in that moment, these human understandings of economics and food distribution, human understandings of loss and, and fame will be turned upside down. He is telling those first disciples, surely as an act of preparation for them, that there will be some hard days ahead as they seek to follow him. And yet, is the message only one of sticking it out in those difficult times while waiting for the day when things will finally be better? Fred Craddock, who is a renowned preacher and scholar of the last century, deals with that very question in a commentary on this text when he says, does this mean that this entire passage is descriptive of a condition still in God's future? Luke's answer, he says, is yes and no. Both the blessings and the woes are anchored in the present. Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And woe to you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. Both of those conditions are realized, he said, not promises for the future. However, in blessings and woes two and three and four, now is contrasted with you shall, clearly indicating future fulfillment. The joining of present and future, he says, reminds us that the reality of the end of the time is already beginning with the advent of Jesus. The prophecy concerning the poor, the diseased, and the oppressed is no longer a hope but it is an agenda for the followers of Jesus. In other words, to hear Jesus speak of the kingdom of heaven is not simply something to which we cling, knowing that that day will come, but rather that we are to be engaged in the hard work now of drawing closer to what God envisions. It does not mean that we simply take comfort in knowing that when Jesus returns, all will be as God intended it from the beginning, but rather that we are involved in that hard work now. It does not mean that creation will ever get fully to where God has intended for it to be, at least not until Jesus comes back. Nor does it mean that any one of us has absolute understanding of what has to be done, for it is clear that we have much to learn from those who face injustice and hardship now. And yet it does mean that despite that human dilemma that we all know, that we busy ourselves with drawing creation closer to what God wants it to be but to do so with what might be described as a kind of cultural humility. 
A couple years ago, a book came out entitled When Helping Hurts. And its basic premise is that there are all kinds of poverty in human existence. And at one point, one of the authors speaks of a time when that became vividly clear again for himself. One Sunday, he said, I was walking with a staff member through one of Africa's largest slums, the massive Kabira slum of Nairobi, Kenya. The conditions were simply inhumane. People living in shacks constructed out of cardboard boxes. Foul smells gushed out of open ditches, carrying human and animal waste. I had a hard time keeping my balance, he said, as I continually slipped on the brown substances that I hoped were mud, but feared were something else. Children picked through garbage dumps, looking for anything of value. As we walked deeper and deeper into the slum, my sense of despair increased as he thought to himself, this place is completely God forsaken. Then to my amazement, I heard the sound of a familiar hymn. And he thought to himself, there must be Western missionaries conducting an open air service in here. As we turned the corner, my eyes landed on the shack from which the music bellowed. Every Sunday, 30 of the local dwellers crammed into this 10 by 20 foot sanctuary to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The church was made out of cardboard boxes that had been opened up and stapled to studs. It wasn't pretty, but it was a church made up of some of the poorest people on earth. When we arrived at the church, he continued, I was immediately asked to preach the sermon. As a good Presbyterian, I quickly jotted down some notes about the sovereignty of God and was looking forward to teaching this congregation the historic doctrines of the Reformation. But before the sermon began, the service included a time of sharing and prayer. I listened as some of the worshipers cried out to God, Jehovah Jireh, please heal my son as he is going blind. Another prayed, merciful Lord, please protect me when I go home today, for my husband always beats me. Sovereign King, please provide my children with enough food today as they are hungry. As I listened to those people praying to be able to live another day, he thought, I then pondered my ample salary, my life insurance policy, my health insurance policy, my two cars, my house. I realized that I do not really trust in God's sovereignty on a daily basis, as I have sufficient buffers in place to shield me from most economic shocks. I realized that when these people pray the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, their minds do not wander as mine so often does. I realized that while I have sufficient education and training to deliver a sermon on God's sovereignty with no forewarning, these people were trusting in God's sovereignty just to get them through the day. And I realized that these people had a far deeper intimacy with God than I probably will ever have in my life. On a day long ago, Jesus promised the coming of the kingdom of God when there will no longer be cardboard houses or cardboard churches. He talked of a time when no longer will children be looking through dumps, nor will there be ditches with foul smells. He told of a day when no longer will people grieve 
or will they be pushed aside? All of that will end when God's eternal realm starts. But we are not there yet. So until that day, we are to continue to work for economic justice and the end to hunger. Until that day, we are to continue walking with those who grieve and those who have been pushed aside. And until that day, those of us for whom Jesus' words bring discomfort are reminded that we have much to learn from those for whom his words bring only hope. All in such a way that we will work toward making this world ever a bit closer to God's intention now, giving a glimpse of what one day it will be. Let us pray. We give thanks, O oh God, for those moments when our efforts join with yours, draw creation closer to your intention. We pray that you will give us eyes of faith and spirits of courage that we might continue in that vital effort, even as we wait for that moment when you make all things new. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We now move to a time of great joy as the sacrament of baptism is administered to Vivian Josephine Sorlante, daughter of Eric and Crystal. We would invite them to come forward to join Becca and me at the baptismal font and for the sponsors to join us as well. And for our elder sponsor, Judy Jane Cody, to join us at the lectern. Hear these words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Obeying the words of our Lord Jesus and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. For in baptism, God cleans us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love and peace and justice. Let us then remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate now this sacrament. On behalf of the session, I present Vivian Josephine Cerlante to receive the sacrament of baptism. Crystal and Eric, do you desire that Vivian be baptized? Yes. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your daughter? Yes. To the sponsors, do you promise through prayer and example to support and encourage Vivian to be a faithful Christian? If so, please answer, we do. And then to the congregation, do you as members of the Church of Jesus Christ promise to guide and nurture Vivian by word and deed with love and prayer, encouraging her to know and follow Christ and to be a faithful member of this church? If so, please answer, we do. We rejoice with you and again claim our own baptism through these waters. Through baptism, we enter into a covenant with God, one that God established long ago, before time was even a thing. And with this covenant, God gives us new life. 
and water does that too. It guards us from evil, and it nurtures us in love. And so we embrace this covenant, and we choose whom we serve. We turn from evil, and we turn to Jesus Christ. As God embraces you within this covenant, I ask all of us, and you, to reject sin, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of this church, a faith in which we baptize. So I ask you these questions. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, say, I do. Who is your Lord and Savior? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? And let us, as a whole church, also stand and say what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was received by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Then he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. You may be seated. Let us take a moment and realize the gift that water is. And we can pray that this water is restorative and renewing. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we give you for this gift of water, this water that brings all things into life. There is not one living thing that exists if it were not the gift of water. Send your spirit to move over this water. Wash away the sin of all who are cleansed by it, bringing them to new life, and grant them into the body of Christ. Amen. Vivian, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May God mark you in these waters, and know that you are loved forever. Amen. What a smile. <laughs> at this time, I'd love to bring this smile to you, as I, I'm going to bring Vivian along with me. This, my friend, is your new sibling in Christ, Vivian. Take a look and see this child, who will not be a child like this for very long, as you know, newborns grow and develop so fast. You will be this child's Sunday school teacher, confirmation mentor. You'll show her the bridge in which she will use her strong legs that she newly knows how to walk, to run. And maybe remind her not to climb on the railings, right? <laughs> this is our child, who we will give a promise to, and we will show love. It is our charge to share with Vivian how much God loves her, as we have known that God loves us. Please join in the welcome as found printed in your bulletin. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you into Christ Church to share with us in his ministry, for we are all one in Christ. Vivian Josephine Cerlante has been received into the one holy Catholic and apostolic church through baptism. God has made her a member of the household of God to share with us in the priesthood of Christ. Let us welcome the newly baptized. <laughs>
now to our concerns of the church, and at this time, I'd like to invite our friend from the Mission Committee, Katie Toner, to join me up here. And while she is coming forward, I'd love for you all to take those acts of friendship pad that are on the, the aisles and mark that you're not only here, but also if there's a way that you want to connect with us, um, we would love to know in what ways we might be able to pray with you or if there's a change in what is going on in your life. Katie? My name is Katie, and since this past summer, a few members of DPC and I have had the joy of joining the twice-monthly community meals at Bethel Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. You may, you may recall that earlier this winter, DPC took part in a coat drive uh, as part of our ongoing partnership with Bethel Presbyterian. From hot meals and groceries to winter coats and school supplies, the faithful people at Bethel do what they can to meet the immediate needs of the people around them. As we continue our collaboration with Bethel, Grace Maribel, elder of the church, has identified a need for socks and underwear for the people they serve. So in February, collection boxes will be in the Andrew Hall entrance and the church building's narthex and Mercer stairwell. You can also drop off items during the food collection drive through on Sunday, February 20th. That's next Sunday. Small to medium, or sorry, small to triple XL underwear. And crew socks in black and white for adults of all genders are needed. Please join the Mission Committee and the Matthew 25 Initiative in this collaboration with our siblings in Christ as we support those in need of clothing. Thank you all. I wanted to turn your attention to uh, several other things that are going on in our congregation that will enliven you. Uh, one of the um, enjoying things that we have going on is that you are able to sign up for growth groups right now. Uh, you can sign up online and also there's a table as you go across the bridge that I mentioned earlier. And then a little later in February, we're having an organ concert that also envisions some storytelling and it will be brought to us right here in our sanctuary and it will be a time for us uh, to be together, and it's also very appropriate for our children and family, so we invite you to that particular thing. And all of the other things you can find in your wonderful bulletin. We have some joys this morning to share with you, as we have uh, two flowers, you'll notice. We had the birth of two different babies, one a little bit longer ago. Bodie Hugh Brown was born on January 5th, and then we also have a very recent addition to the DPC family. Um, as Oliver Thornton Vandersall, and so we are delighted to tell you about those sorts of things that are going on in our lives and uh, to celebrate with the grandparents that we might know in our midst. We also have a couple of other prayer concerns that have come to us, and I also wanted to alert you of the ones that came to us from the 830 service this morning, and they go deep into our congregation, and so let me share some of them with you. We're praying for the Laird family whose son Sean passed away yesterday. We have prayers for healing for Darcy, for a grandson, for Tamara, for continued prayers for Lieutenant Commander David Walla, for Tara, for Deborah. We're praying also for those who have suffered from gun violence and for someone dealing with difficulties, Randy. We know that God brings all of these to prayer, and then also throughout the week, we heard about Derek Gearhart, who passed away yesterday, and it is with our own whole heart that we come alongside the Gearhart family in praying. We also found out that Gail Crook passed away and has entered the church triumphant. 
And along with these, we also pray for Glenda as the passing of her own mom. We pray for healing, a friend of Alice Fitzgerald. We pray for Gail Peters as she recovers from surgery. We pray for our dear guests who come and be part of our Code Blue Shelter here. And then we have some thanks from Miriam Montgomery, who says that a few weeks ago, we were able to be part of her 100th birthday celebration, and she sends her thanks. Let's turn to God in prayer. Spirit of life, turn us away from day-to-day -day living and remind us that we are eternal people. Guide us into the places of rest and respite and remind us that we're not machines who consume and produce, but we are living, holy beings in need of tender love and care. And God, others around us need that love and care. So we pray for the families of those who are affected by loss, for the Gearhart family, for the Childs family, for the Laird family, and the Peters family. God, those in need of healing, and there are many, even beyond these cards and the ones that we know about, for Darcy, a grandson, Tamara, Lieutenant Commander David Walla, for Tara, and Deborah, for Gail. God, we are thankful for the burden and the responsibility to be alongside these people and to pray from far away or even be at their bedside. God, we know that there's more work to be done in the world and give us eager hearts for the wholeness that requires justice work and lead us into peace in this world. O oh, Spirit of life, breathe on us and move us and show us the way and the truth and the life through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Our ushers await upon us as they receive our gifts of our tithes and our offerings.
with me in prayer. Gracious and most merciful God, look upon us with favor as we bring to you these, our tithes and offerings. We are rich in your blessings, and it is right that we return to your kingdom from our bountiful resources. We thank you for your boundless love, showing us how to love ourselves and all those around us. May your spirit be with us today and every day, guiding our life's activities and caring for all your people. Use our gifts, use us, and all God's people say, Amen. Return no one evil for evil, but instead strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, rejoicing in the power and love of God. And may the great grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and sustain you on this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>